In our next lesson on oxidative phosphorylation from Chapter 15, we'll do a brief overview of the electron transport system and look in particular at Complex 1. In our last lesson, we reviewed the structure of the mitochondrion in, in detail. Let me just remind you that the outer membrane, the most external region, is highly permeable, while the inner membrane is a lipid bilayer and therefore highly impermeable. The intermembrane space is the area between these two membranes, and the matrix is the most internal region. The membrane-bound components of the electron transport system are located within the region of the highly convoluted inner membrane. You'll want to notice the orientation of each of the components of the electron transport system as we examine them, and to this end, always note the relative locations of the matrix and the inner membrane space in the figures used. The oxidative part of the system begins with the transfer of electrons to this respiratory chain, and that's illustrated here. Of course, during the processes of catabolism, we oxidized nutrients and we passed those electrons to universal acceptors like NAD plus or NADP plus. These were diffusible carriers. And now we're going to take those diffusible carriers that are carrying those electrons and pass them to this electron transport chain, and that's illustrated at the top of the screen here. They're going to be passed sequentially to a series of components within this chain, and ultimately those electrons be will be passed to some terminal carrier in the case of aerobic respiration that's passed to oxygen. In the process of transferring those electrons, we're going to use the energy we gain to pump protons. They are pumped, as you can see here, from out of the matrix to the intermembrane space. Since we're pumping protons to the intermembrane space, we're going to accumulate positive charges, and so we call that the P side. The matrix side, since we're losing protons, is getting more of a negative charge, and we call that the N side. The easiest way to remember this is that the matrix is the most internal part of the organelle. It is the N side. As we pass these electrons along, keep in mind that what's driving the flow of electrons is that reduction potential. And so each successive acceptor in the system has a higher reduction potential, a greater likelihood of receiving that electrons. And so they flow down the energy gradient. In the process, we're going to actually recover some energy in that process. It keeps the electrons moving in one direction. And here's our final electron acceptor, oxygen. Remember, that has the highest reduction potential overall. Here are the four main complexes in this electron transport chain. Complex 1 takes electrons from NADH and passes them eventually to coenzyme Q. Complex 2 takes electrons from FADH2 and also passes them to coenzyme Q. Complex 3 takes the electrons from Q to pass them to cytochrome C and cytochrome C passes them finally to complex 4. Complex 4 then passes them finally to oxygen. And you'll notice that in alternate steps we're going to pump protons. It's important to recognize electron flow is either from 1 to 3 to 4 in terms of the major complexes, or from 2 to 3 to 4. In other words, electrons never flow from 1 to 2, and we'll see why as we move along. So let's look in greater detail at complex 1. It's going to initially receive electrons from NADH, as illustrated here, and eventually pass them to Q to form ubiquinol QH2. It's going to go through a series of redox centers. Initially, it's transferred to flavin mononucleotide, or FMN, as illustrated here. Secondly, to an iron sulfur center. And then finally, to Q. As the electrons are passed, we're going to also pump some protons, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So for each of these cases, as we pass those electrons along, they have to be passed to uh, each of these redox centers has to have a higher reduction potential than the one that's transferring those electrons. Let's look at some of those redox centers. Here's flavin mononucleotide. The oxidized form is on the left. It can receive two electrons and two 
protons to form FMNH2, the reduced form, on the right. Let's look a little bit more at those iron sulfur clusters. They could be two iron, two sulfur clusters, the iron atoms picture here in kind of an orange color, and then the, the uh, brighter orange color are the sulfur atoms. As you can see, a two iron, two sulfur cluster at the top of the screen, and a four iron, four sulfur cluster at the bottom. Now you notice, let's look at that two iron, two sulfur cluster. The iron atoms are actually complexed to four sulfur atoms each only two of these are sulfide atoms. The other sulfurs are part of the sulfhydryl side chains of cysteine, likewise for the four iron four sulfur clusters. And the iron atom is going to go from the oxidized form, iron 3, to the reduced form, iron 2. Now it's tempting to say, well if we have a two iron two sulfur cluster, that can carry two electrons. If we have a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster, that can carry 4 electrons. But whether it's 2 iron atoms or 4, they function as a single unit. So no matter how many iron atoms might be present in the cluster, they only carry one electron at a time. As was mentioned before, as it passes these electrons along, the energy that we gain will allow us to pump protons, and through complex one, we have enough energy to pump four protons. Remember, they're going from inside to outside. We're pumping them outside of the matrix. And you want to realize that these protons are relayed through a hydrogen bonding network, as it were, like a proton wire. It's not a porin or a transport protein. It's more akin to the proton jumping that we saw in the water networks in Chapter 2. In our next video lesson, we want to see how the Q cycle operates to move electrons to the next carrier. And we'll see why there are multiple contributors to the QL pool, and we'll also look at how complex 3 operates.